six, five, four, three, two, one. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of the Project Egg Show. I'm your host, Ben Gothard, and today we have the honor of speaking with Winston Ben Clements. Uh, gentlemen. the heights to which uh, he, he will travel and uh, incredible things that um, that lie ahead. So anyways, Winston, thank you so much for I want to jump right in. Let's do it. Um, I want to know what is your story? <laughs> yeah, sure. So I guess just to give you a few headlines and then maybe we can dive in deeper into a few areas so I guess the obvious thing for anyone who sees me for the first time is I'm quite small I'm three foot tall I'm in a wheelchair and that's because I was born with a condition known as brittle bones disorder and actually what that meant Ben was that by the age of 12 I had fractured over 150 bones which is not a fun place to be I don't know if you've ever fractured anything Ben or anyone listening but it's not fun and so I had to have that I guess physical trauma over and over especially during my younger years um, and to date up until now I probably fractured over 200 bones in total um, but I guess where my story becomes interesting is I haven't let those physical limitations hold me back so you know I was fortunate enough to be able to get through school to uh, to get a degree in computer science and then I went on to work for some of the largest global organizations in technology and financial services. I'm having a really good career. And I guess the place where I'm at now is where I'm looking at the next evolution. Um, and I've decided to kind of step back a bit from corporate and to focus more on my public speaking because I believe this is a way of me to share my message, share my lessons, my, my failures as well. And hopefully inspire somebody who's listening to this right now to think, hey, you know what? If that little dude in a wheelchair can get out there and do some stuff, then maybe I can do something too. You talked about the message, sharing your message, moving from the corporate world to, to speak and, and um, you know, really embrace the message. I'm curious mm. as to what is that message? Mm. And I really want to go in depth on what it is, how you developed it, and why that's so important to you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, funny enough, speaking wasn't really a natural career for me uh, or natural place for me to go because, like I said, I graduated computer science. Um, really, by nature, I'm a techie, I'm a geek. Um, and so, you know, I was at a stage where I guess like many people in IT will relate to this, we're more comfortable talking with computers than we are talking with people. And so for me, stepping into public speaking initially was just as a way of building my confidence, improving my communication, um, because it actually stemmed from having to give a couple of presentations at work uh, in, the, in the corporate setting. And really hating those situations because I just hated the idea of getting up on stage. You know, like many people will relate, you know, public speaking is not fun if you're not, you know, in the right mindset for it. And so I guess after having those couple of horrific presentations at the office, I thought, hey, you know what, this is something that I need to work on because it seemed like that was something that I would have to do more regularly. Um, so initially when I started practicing public speaking and hanging out with other public speakers, it was literally then just to improve my confidence. Um, and then what happened was I was at a Toastmasters meeting, which you might be aware of. Um, and for anyone listening, you know, Toastmasters is just a, a, well, it's a global organization of people who want to develop their public speaking skills. Um, and, you know, you just meet up and you have an opportunity to get up on a stage and to share your message and to uh, just to get that practice of speaking to an audience, uh, which wasn't natural for me at the time. Um, and anyway, so during, you know, my period with Toastmasters, I got connected with somebody who um, who became a bit of a mentor. And um, 
I guess he started to to indicate that he saw something um something unique about me and he thought that I might have a possibility of actually going beyond Toastmasters and actually doing my speaking on on a larger scale because he he liked my message, I suppose. Um, I mean, I was a bit skeptical at the time, um, but eventually uh, he persuaded me to apply for a TED Talk. Um, and if I'm honest, then initially I just did it to shut him up <laughs> uh, because, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he was on my case for a long time. He's like, go for the TED Talk, go for it, go for it, go for it. And I was like, okay, fine, I'll do it. I'll get the rejection and then we can stop talking about it. But I didn't quite go to that plan because I actually got accepted for a TED Talk. And then now I was really petrified because I was thinking, okay, damn, now I actually have to go and present on a <laughs> TED platform. Um, this is, uh, I'm not ready for this. <laughs> <laughs> um, but anyway, it happened and, you know, I did a lot of prep. I probably over-prepared um, and um, it went really well. Well, at least it was really well received. And I got a lot of feedback, got a lot of uh, views and, you know, really positive feedback on YouTube. And actually, I think even more than the speaking feedback, that the feedback that really um, made me feel a sense of reward was when I had messages from different parts of the world, you know, people from Chile, uh, people from Australia, you know, parts of Asia um, saying, you know, they just by watching me on stage, they just felt inspired and that they felt that they could you know, to do more and to be more in whatever situation that they were in. And I guess to your question, Ben, I guess that's where the message started to kind of form um, because I realized, you know, and, and this will be relatable to many people, you know, Winston's story is Winston's story. You know, Ben's story is Ben's story. To us as individuals, our stories are quite boring. They're quite mundane because it's a life that we live. Um, but it's not until you share your story, you share your message, your wisdom, your learnings, and then you see the impact or the shift that your story can bring to somebody else that you realize that actually we all have some something valuable um, to bring to the table. And I guess my message has evolved over time, um, but the, the big premise is around, you know, overcoming barriers, overcoming um, limitations and just looking at obstacles as an opportunity to grow, whether they're physical, mental, emotional, relationship, financial, we all have an opportunity to, to step forward through those things. I love that. I love that. So let's actually let's actually dive in and, and drill into that uh, mm. message a bit. I from from what it's kind of sending the signals off of my head is is like you know we have obstacles and then those are actually kind of the keys or the or the growth opportunities that we have to tackle to get to that next level, whether it be consciousness or or reward or achievement. Um, why does that happen and how do we actually turn those obstacles mm. into the the stepping stones? Mm, mm. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, well, obstacles happen because of life. If you're alive, you're going to face obstacles. <laughs> um, nobody, you know, no matter how much money they have, how much, you know, whatever background they come from, everybody is going to face an obstacle and it's going to be, you know, we, we all face different types of obstacles. Um, you know, I was having, I think I've had a conversation with somebody where they said to me, hey, Winston, you are super resilient. I mean, look at all this stuff that you've been through and yet you're still able to have the career, have the speaking uh, stuff going on, um, drive a car and all of these amazing things that you do. Um, you must be the most, you know, the strongest, the most perseverant person in the universe. And I was like, well, well, I'll take the compliment, but I don't think I am. Um, I think it's just life presents each of us with our own unique challenges because we don't all live the same life. And the way I see it, it's almost because one of the things that I talk about is resilience and you build resilience by stepping and navigating through those obstacles, right? Um, and so for me, I compare it to going to the gym, you know, I have friends who go to the gym and, you know, I can see the work that they put in. And initially it's painful, right? If you haven't been to the gym, let's say for six months or something, and then today is day one at the gym, you're going to be aching at the end of that session. Um, and so for me, the way I see obstacles is almost like going to the gym. It, it tests you 
um, it puts you under pressure, under stress, under under situations which you probably wouldn't enjoy at the time. But when you come out the other side, that's when you realize, oh, just like going to the gym, all of a sudden I've got these muscles showing up. It's like, whoa. Um, so so I, I see obstacles as, as a way of learning, a way of growing. Um, and one really cool quote which I like is just to see failure as feedback, uh, which is a, which is a famous quote. Um, because a lot of people think when they're faced with a setback, a failure, an obstacle, then that's the end. Um, but if you take that situation and almost ask yourself a question like, "What is this teaching me? What is this? What is this?" Um, business going bust teaching me what is this broken relationship teaching me what is living with a disability teaching me what are the skills that i'm developing in life to navigate um despite this stuff and i think that's where the true gems will be discovered because you realize that you actually have um you have a lot more strength of character and power than what you've envisaged for yourself it seems like there, there may be two kind of competing ideas here, or at least that that's what uh, mm-hmm. what uh, has, has popped up to me. One is that there are just inherently obstacles that will come your way. And so you break through those, you you learn resilience, you um, uh, maybe discover the depth of character that that is truly there. maybe you maybe you grow that depth. I'm, I'm not exactly sure which. But but more of the obstacles kind of come to you. The other one, it would seem, is that you could actually go out and take action and almost like find the obstacles that you want to overcome, right? So like if you choose to start a business, you're kind of rushing headfirst into a certain set of obstacles as opposed to just kind of letting life happen to you. And I think that almost goes back to like a, like a um, you know, Taoist versus Confucianist um philosophy or, or, or a competition of philosophy. So where do your um, beliefs lie as far as um, kind of working with the obstacles that come to you versus going out and putting yourself mm. in place to find more obstacles? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a really good point, actually. Yeah, that, that, that's a really cool way of um, spinning it. And I think I think they feed into each other. I think although they are competing, um, they are also transferable. Um, so I believe that um, nowadays, as an entrepreneur, as a you know, I have my own business as a motivational speaker, and you know, for anyone in business, and I'm sure there'll be a few entrepreneurs listening to this, um, we all face obstacles, right? And you know, those are obstacles particular to starting out as a as a startup. Um, you know, trying to win new clients, trying to um, trying to grow the business, try, trying to put enough, um, you know, money in your bank account so that you can pay your bills at the end of the day. Um, and hopefully you have a bit of fun doing something that you love while you do that. Um, and I think for me, in, in terms of, so sort of stepping from being in the corporate world and now into being an entrepreneur, um, what I also realized was, you know, all of those um, I guess you could call them challenges or all of those things that I had to persevere through because of my disability, because of, you know, being, you know, born with a condition that required me to, you know, to be extremely patient because I was breaking bones every time, right? Almost once a month um, in my early years, um, you know, being in a wheelchair and having to figure out how to navigate the environment because the environment isn't always suited you know, for somebody in a wheelchair, um, and you know, just just developing these uh, transferable skills around creativity, innovation, problem solving. Um, so those, um, I guess, ideas were formed from those natural obstacles. But then, what I realized was that I could actually transfer those things into you know these obstacles that I went out looking for when I became an entrepreneur, right? So any entrepreneur will accept that you do need to be creative. You do need to be innovative. You need to be, you need to be brave, right? You need to be able to pick up the phone and speak to somebody, and hopefully find a way of creating a win-win so that they want to work with you. Um, so, so I think that's my, my thinking on those things is 
definitely go out and look for those situations which make you uncomfortable um, because that's the only way to grow. Um, and again, going back to my gym analogy. So once you've been in the gym for 21 days, your legs don't hurt as much as they did on day one. So, <laughs> so you know, the more you do it, the, I don't want to say the easier it becomes, but the more you find a way of stepping into a flow state where things just seem to fall into place much easier because you've been working those muscles. I also think there's an element. Uh, oh, by the way, I love what you were talking about, about um, the transference of, of that. Mm. Working with the natural obstacles that we all just have, you know, given kind of the, the cards we were dealt. Yes. Uh, but, but then using those strengths that we've developed to then go pick and choose which ones we want and then go, you know, go and kind of carve our own path. And, and that second piece, that's really what I'm interested um, in, in discussing next with you is those obstacles that you've chosen to take on, right? The, the path that you've chosen. Um, how intentional have you been about the path that you've gone down and how has that intentionality um, evolved over time? Mm, mm. Yeah, I guess uh, just to kind of give you a backstory as well. So I guess I've, I've always, I've always felt that I had more. I, I guess I had an intuition would be maybe the right word to use. That I I am on this planet for a reason. So I've always had that feeling. Um, and so even while I was working in, you know, in corporate and having, you know, successful career, getting the promotions, you know, all of those things, which by society's view um, are very good things to have, right? Because I'm taking all the boxes. I've got the job, the house, you know, the car and everything. Um, internally, I always felt that I could still do more. I could still, um, I feel like I should be helping people on a bigger scale. Um, now, I didn't know at the time that that would be connected to speaking in any way, um, but I just always had this thing of I need to be, I need to be out there, whatever that means. Um, and so when I, and, and I'm really fortunate because I think there's a lot of people who feel the same way. They feel, you know, they have something to give that is bigger than, you know, what they're currently doing, their day-to-day -day stuff, um, but they just don't know where to start. Um, and, and there's not really, I wish I could give you a silver bullet for that, but there's not really an easy answer for that. I was just really fortunate that I experimented with something which I believe turned out to be the thing for me, and that was public speaking. Um, now, if you had asked me, you know, two, three years before that about becoming a public speaker, hell no. I mean, initially, I kind of stepped into it, like I said, you know, kicking and screaming because... It was. It just wasn't natural for me. Um, and then because I was so fortunate to step into this area where I got some good feedback, which gave me that confidence to keep going. And then I did the TED Talk, which, again, had a bigger impact. And then I started having, you know, corporations and people doing amazing events, empowering events, um, you know, personal development events to help people to reach their potential, reaching out to me and saying, hey, Winston, we think you have something to add, you know, in our in our group, in our event, in our organization. Um, things just kind of landed really nicely for me. Um, so I've been really fortunate on that side. And and I think in terms of being super intentional, the, the thing that has helped me stay focused is to set a really big goal now. So I've got a really big specific goal, which is to reach one billion people and help them overcome their limitations. And, you know, because initially, I think maybe it's the way my mind works, but I'm one of those people who, you know, it's like, I want to make an impact, but what is an impact? I need to put some metrics around it. So, you know, in the end, I've decided, hey, I'm going to go for, for the B, the one billion, and, you know, reach out and, and whether it's through platforms, you know, like this amazing platform that you've got going on, or whether it's through me speaking on stage, whether it's through me um, connecting with people on the street or, you know, in any other setting, you know, I feel now that it's my duty to use, um, to almost use my scars as a way of, you know, showing people, hey, you know, if, if someone can get through some of this stuff, then 
I believe you as well have an opportunity to achieve some greatness. I love that. So I'm interested to learn a bit more about that transition of, mm. of uh, not really enjoying public speaking that much to now setting an enormously powerful and yep. amazing goal that is very related to, to public speaking, right? I mean, that's a, that's like a that's like a 180 truly. So what did it feel like when when you're like ah oh, this is the thing. This is it. What did that actually feel like? <laughs> yeah, it, it's it's a good question. Um I think for me initially if if I think back I think the the reason why initially I didn't enjoy public speaking it's probably the reason many other people don't enjoy public speaking, which is, well, first of all, it's scary as hell. But the other thing, which <laughs> is maybe <laughs> less talked about, is the fact that when when you're up on stage, I mean, we can all speak. Most people have the ability to speak unless you have, you know, an inherent medical condition or something like that. But for most people, speaking is something very natural, something that we do every single day. So thinking about it logically, it shouldn't be that much of a jump to go from speaking just how you speak with your friends, your family, your colleagues, to then, you know, speaking to a few more people on a raised platform. It's the same skill, really. But why does it feel like a million times scarier when you get up there? Uh, And one of the things that I started to realize was actually initially when I was going up there, I wasn't thinking about the audience. I was thinking about myself. I was thinking about, oh, God, how does Winston sound? Oh, God, you know, am I happy with the way I'm dressed today? Oh, gosh, you know, my hair, you know, I don't like the way my hair looked this morning. And now I have to go on the platform and speak to 100 people. Um, And so basically what I'm trying to say was initially I was coming from a place of ego, not because I'm like a super selfish person or anything like that, but because... That's what we tend to do when the spotlight is on us and we're under pressure. We go into almost uh, self-preservation mode, I guess, and probably linked to, you know, our, our fight or flight instincts, right? You know, we're under pressure and you're thinking, yeah, I don't like this. So I either, either got to stand up and fight or, you know, I got, I got to run away from this. But uh, what then started to happen, and this took some time um, in my journey as a speaker, was when I, I switched from focusing on myself to focusing on service. So it's all about the audience. It's all about me trying to make that impact with my message, whether it's on one person or on a hundred people. Um, and actually, what I realized then was when I when I switched my when I had that shift, all of a sudden it became much easier. I mean, the nerves never fully go away. And I think it is healthy to have some level of nerves when you're on the stage. As You're a performer when you're on the stage. Um, just like any musician or any rock star or any athlete will tell you, when they get on that their platform, then they do feel a sense of healthy nerves and adrenaline. Um, but I think I was able to move away from all the, um, I guess, debilitating nerves, which you know cause many people to never want to speak in the first place when I switched my mindset to focus on what I was giving and not worrying about the the feedback that I might be getting, although most of it was just probably of my own creation in my head. So, so, you know, for anyone who's sort of thinking about putting themselves out there, then, you know, and this applies in a business context as well, because sometimes we go into business and we think, ah, I found that million dollar business and, you know, I'm just going to go put it out there and make a ton of money. Um, Instead of thinking, what is the problem that I'm trying to solve? You know, because when you fall in love with the problem that you're solving, then, and you become the best in the world at solving that problem, believe me, Ben, and anyone who's listening, if you become the number one person in your field, the money will not be an issue. I love that. I love that. Of really focusing on the audience, focusing on other people, on the service, on the contribution. I think that's powerful. When, when did that really shift for you? I mean, do, is there one moment that really um, stands out in, in your mind? 
Yeah, I think um, there's a, there's a few moments actually, um, and I think it. I was I used to get feedback initially when I was a new speaker. I used to get the feedback that um, we like we like your talk. You know, the content is very nicely structured, very logical, um, but it's missing. The talk is there, but you're not there. You're not in the story. Yeah. And I used to think initially, what does that mean? I, I mean, I was on stage speaking. How could I not be in the story? <laughs> right. <laughs> but what they were trying to say was, you know, they, they couldn't really see. It was almost like a, a corporate presentation, right? You know, you go on, on, you know, in the office and you have to present to, you know, to your CEO or something or to your MD. Um, and you pull out the slide, you know, with all the graphs and all the numbers and all the, all the bar charts and you just talk them through the numbers. I think that's how I was coming across. It was very factual. But what people really want to know, and I think this, again, applies to anybody, whether it's as a presenter, as a speaker, as an athlete, musician, whatever. Um, yes, you might be technically the most gifted person in your field. But actually, more importantly, try. you want to be looking to show yourself. It, it has to be unique to you. Uh, put your own spin on whatever it is that you're doing. Because I'm not the only motivational speaker in the world, right? But I'm the only motivational speaker that can do it the way Winston does it, right? So without the Winston piece in it, then I'm just, you know, I'm just like anybody else. But as soon as I'm able to tell my own unique stories, to bring my personality, whether it's, you know, humor, if that's who you are, whether it's, you know, um, telling amazing stories, cracking jokes, whatever is unique to you. However you would speak to a friend, basically, is how you should be presenting on a stage. Because it, it's not really authentic for me to to be here on, on this podcast and talking to you, smiling and laughing, and then go up on a platform in front of 100 um, leaders and CEOs, and all of a sudden I'm this really uptight, serious guy, you know, and, and not able to... to to project in the way that I would like to. So be yourself. And I think well, the longer I kept getting that feedback, it took me hearing that feedback over a period of time for, for it to be like, aha, I just need to be me and all the other stuff will take care of itself. It really seems like the core of that message is, is about finding your own voice and letting that shine through, right? And that's something that, you know, as a as a, a broadcaster, podcaster, storyteller, um, that's something that I found fascinating. Is how do you both you have because you have to bring the content, you have to bring yeah. the value, you have to bring the information, the wisdom, the knowledge, the experience that has to be there. Yes, but to really touch the the heartstrings or, or or touch the lives of the people who are receiving the information. That is something, that's an art. That's an art, man. And that is an art and a science. Seriously. But I think we're all capable of it. Um, because like, like we touched on earlier, we all do this art science-y thing when we're talking with our friends. You know, it, it comes out, right? It's very easy to, if, if you're out having, you know, a beer or having a coffee with your friend and, you know, the conversation is in full flow, in that moment, there, there is no, there is no mask, there is no shield that you, you're able to open up completely. So it's it's almost finding a way of um, deconstructing those masks and those shields when you're on that stage performing. And you know this could mean different things for different people. And I think one of the things that has really helped me. Um, so this will be a piece of maybe tip for anyone who is a presenter. Um, and I think it can work in other areas as well, is to, first of all, listen to the feedback that you keep getting over and over. Um, don't, yeah, don't be like me and need to hear it like 20 times before you actually take note. <laughs> um, because I think people will always, when you're on that public arena, which you will be as a speaker, as a performer, even as a business owner, an entrepreneur, um, Every man and his dog is going to have an opinion about how you should do that thing that you do, right? Um, and I think it, it's well-versed wisdom that you shouldn't just listen to anybody, but you should be listening to people who are doing the thing that you're doing, first of all, 
And secondly, they should be ahead of you, you know, whether it's as a speaker. If, if, I, if I'm looking for feedback for my speaking, then I should only be listening really to people who are in the same industry and also people who are further ahead of me in terms of experience or, you know, in terms of what their achievements are to that point. Because the danger is you can end up listening to everybody and then almost not know where to start, right? Um, and, and I think that's been a, a really good tip for me to, to kind of start to hone in on the specific things that I need to work on when I'm able to hear them over and over again, but not just from anybody, from the expert. Um, and I think that's one of the keys that really helped me to, to start to harness my, um, my authenticity on the stage because it just kept coming up. I love that we've, that the, the conversation has gone this way. And to me, it's, it, it appears like there's almost a bit of a duality and in, in like a balance, right? Because on the one hand, we're talking about focusing on the audience and focusing on serving the people and, you know, our, our attention is on the people, what we can do. But on the other hand, we have to be ourselves. So there's some innate focus on ourselves, right? So it's like, it's like, there's this, there's this fine line, this, this very fine balance, I feel, of being audience focused, but also being true to who you are. Mm. And, and I feel like that's a, that's a beautiful dance that we all have to go through and we all have to, to do the dance. Right. Um, what are your thoughts on how to best come to that balance? Because what it seems like is, or at least in, in my experiences is that I know sometimes I'll go way to one side and then I'll have to go way to the other side and then keep kind of going back and forth until I eventually hone in on it. Um, cause I don't always listen the first time either. <laughs> so, so what have been, uh, your, your experiences and, in, in, um, you know, being able to get to that place and, and really your philosophy on, on doing mm, stuff? Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's a good, it's a good point you raised. And I think, you know, cause I'm an entrepreneur myself and I have many entrepreneur friends. And I think one of the biggest challenges that I've experienced and that I've seen, um, that is commonly raised is you know as entrepreneurs when when you start a business whether it's a speaking business or you know it could be selling oranges whatever it is right we want to appeal to everybody we want to appeal to every single person on earth because i remember when i was speaking to well i got connected with another speaker who's you know super experienced he's global you know he does all these amazing conferences and the first thing he asked me was winston what do you speak about and who do you speak it to and I was like, um, I'm a motivational speaker and I believe my message is for everybody. And he was like, ah, okay. And I could just kind of see the disappointment on his face because I think he was hoping for a bit more of a meat on the bones on that answer. Um, and I think that's, that's a lesson, it was a lesson for me and maybe a lesson for entrepreneurs listening is, and, and I think this ties back in nicely with that whole authenticity piece. Um, sometimes we're scared to be authentic because we think if I if I show my true colors, then it's only going to attract this type of person, right? And then I'm going to be excluding the rest of the world. Um, so, for example, for me, I, I want to reach a billion people, right? But I'm thinking, you know, I've got this style, you know, I'm humorous, I'm always smiling, um, I'm quite conversational and relaxed, and that works for some events, some, you know, corporations, because it fits in with their culture, but not for others. Um, so maybe as an entre entrepreneur or as a speaker, I might be tempted to just try to be, to be all things to everybody, you know, by sort of changing myself, depending on who I was speaking to or who I was providing a service for. Um, but I think you would rather hundred be 100% authentic version of you, Ben, and deliver that full, you know, 100% version of you and attract the people, whether it's a smaller group or, you know, a medium-sized group, whatever. But it puts you in a position that once you have that niche, once you have that, um, yeah, that, that specific following that is perfect to whatever value you have to give, then you can actually truly extend your talents because now you're delivering 
you're delivering things which are coming out of the best version of you as opposed to a more diluted version where, yeah, you might be able to do an okay job, but why not just focus on being great all the time, even if it means to a different size audience than what you'd like. I mean, I'd, I'd settle for half a billion. That would do me just fine. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. And, and I think you're so right of compromising your voice or, or your identity mm. to try to please more people. It, that so backfires. I mean, that so backfires almost 100% of the time. And here's the thing. If you do an amazing, amazing job, and of course, this is from my experience that, that I'm, I'm speaking from. If you do an amazing job with something and you really put your heart and soul into it, but you do an amazing job for only one person, that person is going to tell other people. And then ne maybe next time you'll have two people or maybe next time you'll have three people. And you do you bring that same intensity, that same ferocity of spirit. And then those three people, they all tell one person. And then it just, it's a compounding effect. And eventually, I believe you will run into people who don't like your message. And you know what? That's okay. It's okay. Yeah, exactly. It's okay. <laughs> like, that's totally within our, like, our, uh, freedoms as human beings that i believe in is the right to be able to choose what we like in our minds and what we don't like that is totally or at least in my opinion should totally be a human right and yeah. and yeah that's just okay i think it's actually yeah. empowering <laughs> it is and i think maybe where this comes from as well is you know we live in this age of social media right ben you know we're, we're the instagram generation and, you know, a, a lot of our ideas, our values are driven by likes and follows and, you know, engagement. And, you know, there is no dislike button on Instagram. Everything is, you know, you either get the like or you get nothing. <laughs> right. So, and, and I think in some ways that starts to cloud our judgment sometimes because when we're not getting the engagement, when we're not getting showered with positive feedback all the time, um, then we either assume that, you know, people hate us, um, you know, it, 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 it's that extreme. If they don't like me, they hate me, right? Or, you know, we, we, we just think that whatever service or whatever, whatever product that we have to offer um, isn't, isn't worth delivering. Um, and, and I think that's, that's a big mistake because, you know, exactly like we touched on, if you focus on you know, just use again Instagram as, as an analogy, you know, I, I don't really care for the 100 likes um, if they're all generic. I'd rather get 10 likes of people who really want to work with me, really getting value from my message. And like you touched on earlier, those 10 people are likely to become the evangelists. They're the ones who are going to tell their friends, their family, their coworker, that, you know, I had this amazing service from Ben and I really think you should check him out. So, you know, forget in, in this situation, forget about, you know, having big metrics that don't really mean anything and actually focus on niching down and actually delivering a world-class service to your particular group. I think that's brilliant. And, you know, just, just from the perspective of how we come to crave these these likes, the comments, things that, you know, just by their very nature, they don't actually do anything for you. Like that doesn't really help you that much in the greater scheme of things. I believe based on a lot of research that I've done and a lot of reading um, and studying, you know, different, different um, studies, whether it be academic studies, government studies, uh, reading a lot of books on this, that social media is actually very intentionally engineered to exploit our innate psychological needs, right? Um, for example, we have this, um, uh, this thing called dopamine that is, uh, I, I believe it's called a neurotransmitter, right? And so basically what happens is, is whenever you get, um, when, whenever you get a reward for something based on an action that you've taken, 
that reward rele- like lights up your 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 pathways, the pathways in your brain. And for whatever reason, your brain then registers that as a good thing. You're like, okay, that's good. Let me do more of that. That's how we learn, right? When we do things, get a positive result, and we want to keep doing it, and that's how we mm-hmm. learn, right? Well, what happens is social media rewards us on an infrequent basis based on playing their game, right? So the more we, we, we post, you know, there's a chance that we'll get likes, and those are little rewards, right? And it's very similar to like playing at the casino, you know, like pulling the lever on a slot machine. You don't know if you're going to win. And so because something like Instagram to keep, you know, to stay consistent with, with what we're talking about, because we can always just open up our phones and click it and check, that's a very low cost to get a potential reward that makes you feel good in your brain, right? So that has nothing to do with your value. It has nothing to do with the quality of your message or the impact of how what you're doing and your work is is actually changing somebody's life. It has to do with a, a company who's really, really good at what they do, exploiting your your mind, exploiting your brain. And it's very frustrating to me because I feel like most yeah. people don't understand that, but but you're absolutely right. And I think that is a l- very large contributing factor as to why you're right. And, and I totally agree with you. Yeah, yeah. It, it, yeah, like you said, you said it perfectly. You know, it's the algorithms. They're designed to do that. Um, you know, Instagram, Facebook, you know, all the other major platforms, they want you to stay on their platform. They want you to keep clicking the you know, their their icon to go and check your feed, check if you got any new likes, any new comments. So, you know, they're they're smart people, right? These are people who who studied and who spend a ton of time researching, not just the technology, but the psychology of how the brain works. Um, So, I mean, I think there is is a good use of social media and, you know, exactly what we're doing now. You know, if if you're creating content, if you're creating value, then, you're not just there as a consumer um, because I think the danger is a lot of people are well are, are liable to falling into the trap where you're constantly consuming. So you're 100% in consumption mode, right? So you're literally just going there to just just scroll down the newsfeed and hope, hoping that you'll see a comment or a like or something that makes your, you know, your pathways light up, you know, like you said. Um, and then this, this can also sort of escalate into a situation where you find yourself compared. Maybe you're not happy with the amount of likes you're getting, but, you know, let's use us as an example. Maybe I'm not happy that I'm getting enough likes. And then I go on your Instagram page, Ben, and I see, oh my God, today you got 5,000 likes. And I only got like, 2000 likes and i'm like wow you know i need to be i feel a bit left out now why, why can't i be like ben um and this leads into other situations which can play into mental health stuff stress anxiety because and i think i can't remember who said who said it this way but i think they said it best when they said for many people you find yourself comparing your chapter one to somebody else's chapter 20 um, so if you think of that in an entrepreneurial um, situation, you know, I've just started my business or maybe I've been in business for six months. I'm still kind of getting the hang of it. I'm still not quite, you know, it's not quite running the way I'd like it to. And then I'm comparing myself with, you know, I don't know, Grant Cardone. <laughs> and I'm seeing him driving the limos and buying all the houses and I'm thinking, you know, it, it, it actually becomes demoralizing at that point because you're thinking, the, the gap is so big. How am I ever going to get to that level? But, you know, kind of going back to how I started this piece is if you're able to kind of shift that, uh, to tilt that perspective from being in constant consumption mode into more of a creation mode, then I feel that takes away that almost, you know, envy or, you know, feeling the need to compare with other people because you're 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 already your mind is already occupied. You get your dopamine by giving value to people and providing a service, a work class service to those people that you need to be helping. 
Um, and, you know, if there is a right and a wrong way of getting dopamine, I believe this is the right way, you know, by creating value and giving yourself that sense of reward because you know you're doing something to make the world a better place. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and almost reprogramming your mind to be rewarded by doing good things, things that are things that are actually uh, contributing to the world uh, where, where you're creating or, or you're loving uh, or you're building or you're, you know, you're doing something that is very productive. Um, yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. And, you know, just to, to briefly touch on what you're talking about with comparing yourself to other people, again, I think there's actually a duality there, right? Because if we don't have people to aspire to be like, you know, like, for example, um, I am so, so grateful for all of my mentors and, and these people who have taken time out of their lives to help me on my journey. I mean, that is just, tremendously generous on on their part and i'm so grateful mm. um you know one one of the mentors that that um you know i've just been profoundly impacted by um is a gentleman by the name of ben gay the third and he is the last living protege or, or one of uh, the last living proteges of dr napoleon hill and oh, wow. so so ben has been just a dear dear friend and a very trusted mentor right so I think it's very important to have those people who you can look up to and who you can turn to for guidance and who can give you that really good feedback, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, you know, in my, in my case, sometimes I'll, you know, I'll post something that's kind of dumb or just, you know, say something that's just like, why did you say that? And Ben's like, you know, sometimes Ben will be like, Hey man, um, yeah, I'm, I might challenge you to reconsider that decision. I'm like, and sometimes I'm like, you're right. Sometimes, you know, other times I'm like, you know what? That's just how I feel. You know, I got to, I got to own it. Um, but, but to have somebody to aspire to, yeah. and to get wisdom from and to learn from, I think that's very important. On the other hand, trying to compare yourself to that person at, at, at this point in their journey, I mean, you're setting yourself up for failure because if you're, if you're learning from somebody because they're that much farther ahead of you, they've had a lot more time to figure it out. They've had a lot more uh, path that they've traversed and it's just not fair to you. So it's, it, you're setting yourself up for failure. So I think there is that duality of you need somebody to be able to turn to, to get advice from, to aspire to be, um, to be inspired by, but that, that comparison piece mm. can be very dangerous and actually very <clears throat> counterproductive to you. Yeah, yeah, totally agree. And um, yeah, it's, it's about balance, isn't it? Um, and actually, what I like to use here almost is like a Pareto's law. So like an 80-20. So, you know, in, in my mind, I, I believe you want to be 80% in creation mode and 20% in consumption mode. Um, because that allows you the flexibility to, you know, to look up to your mentors, to connect with amazing people because there's, there's some amazing influencers and coaches and teachers out there um, in in social media world who you might not get to see you know on a day-to-day -day basis because they might live in a completely different country so we're so fortunate to live at a time when people at that level people who are crushing it and doing amazing things have never been as accessible as they are today um, so I think the 8020 works well for me because I know you know, I have an obligation to, to create, you know, value for, for the people who, who belong to my groups and people that need it. But at the same time, that doesn't hinder me from following and learning from those who are the best in the business. I love that. I love that. So when you're going about, um, going about your day and, and you are choosing to consume information, how do you actually go about vetting that information and deciding you know, what you want to learn today or what you want to mm. learn about or what you want um, going into your mind? I mean, is it like a, do you have like a long term course of study where you're like, okay, strategically, I'm going to learn this and this and this and this and this and you kind of just do whatever, like what's your philosophy there? Yeah, it, 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 cha it changes a lot and it probably will continue to change. 
Um, so I'll, I'll give you a couple of different ways that I've done it. So one is, I don't think it was last year, but the year before, where I actually planned out my whole learning for the year. Um, so I think I broke it down into quarters. So, you know, my four quarters. And after I did my goal setting for the year, so I knew which was my big goal for Q1, Q2, Q3, Q4. And for example, Q1 for me was about um, finances, um, building income streams and setting up my business as an entrepreneur. This was a couple of years ago. And so in terms of learning for Q1, I, I, I just focused my learning on reading, you know, all the best, you know, books on money, on entrepreneurship, um, on, actually, no, it was specifically on money, uh, Q1. So I, I read a bunch of books, uh, Warren Buffett. I read a few things by Tony Robbins. And it was really specific because I just wanted to get my mindset around money in, in, in the right place at that time. And then, you know, different things for each quarter. So I think one of my quarters was to do with um, relationships. Another quarter was to do with productivity and pro pro prioritization. Um, so I've done it that way. Um, that's not how I'm currently doing it. So now it, it's a bit more organic, I, I believe. Um, and in terms of sort of getting good sources and good um, good um, material for me to, to look at, I tend to prefer to go on a recommendation. Um, so I'm fortunate to be part of a mastermind group um, of people who are fairly like-minded and people who are in a similar space to what I'm doing. And what I found works really well is to take recommendations of people within that trusted circle. Um, because I know, you know, if you're in my mastermind group and you tell me that you've read a particular book or a particular, you know, you've consumed a particular piece of content, article, whatever, um, then you've kind of almost vetted it for me. Um, and I don't feel the need. Because sometimes when somebody recommends you a book, it could be the best book in the world, by the way. Um, but it could be just recommended by someone who perhaps you're not in the same space or perhaps you know, you're know you you're on different ends of the spectrum, um, however that looks to you. And you take the recommendation. And let, let me give a specific example. You know, I have a... Um, I've been recommended a bunch of books. Like I've gone to um, to the office when I was in the corporate world because I've always been a big reader. And somebody said to me, "Hey, I read this really amazing book. Um, it was about how this guy, you know, climbed up a um, particular mountain and got stranded up there, and he just tells this story about how he overcame all of these things and the lessons that he learned, which sounds like a great story to me, um, <laughs> but almost because." I haven't really vetted the source. I've kind of just kept that on my to-do list. And then it's become one of those things that didn't really happen because it just stayed in my to-do list forever. Um, and this could just be a me thing, but uh, to contrast that, you know, if I'm in my mastermind situation and somebody says to me, hey, Winston, I remember last month you were talking about um, automating your systems as an entrepreneur. And I found this really, I read this really amazing book about that particular topic. Um, and I think you should check it out. See, again, it's really specific because these are people who understand challenges that you're facing at that time. Um, and that is a book that um, that's not going to go on my to-do list. It's going to go in my hands. I'm going to start reading it straight away um, because it's it's addressing things that I'm going through right now. And it's coming from a trusted source. So, so that's my process. Um, I don't believe there's a right or wrong way. I believe, you know, whatever, whatever you read, whatever you consume, whether it's on video, books, whatever, that helps you to learn and to develop and to grow. For me, that's always a positive, uh, no matter how it falls onto your lap. I love that. And I think it's really, I do think it's really important to have that source vetted, whether it be through referrals or through reading reviews or, you know, just really studying the person who wrote it. Yeah. I think that that's also really big. You know, I just finished, um, I was listening to it uh, again, um, was the intelligent investor by Benjamin Graham. And uh, okay. so if, if you look at, if you look at Graham's reputation and then you look at the fact that Warren Buffett says, 
that that's one of the greatest books on investing ever written. It's like, well, I'm pretty sure that's a good one. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's that's good enough for me. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm pretty, pretty sure that works. Um, yeah, couldn't couldn't agree more. Um, I'm interested though in in that shift from that really mm-hmm. structured quarterly uh, learning regimen to now more the organic kind of free flowing um, way that that you've been going mm-hmm. about learning. Um, it's kind of a two-part question. One, why did that change occur? Mm-hmm. And two, has that change actually, or, or was that change in learning just a manifestation of an overall change in your approach towards life, or was it just specific to learning? Yeah, so I think, um, so initially with the structured quarterly approach, I think that, that looking back, at, I haven't actually thought about this before, but looking back, I think that was probably driven by my corporate background. Um, so I guess being in this corporate, super structured environment, everything is nicely laid out in a framework, you know, da, da, da. So I guess when, when I started to focus more on my personal development, then initially my learning was also in a way, even though it was self-help and my own personal development, it was still structured in a pretty corporate way, if that makes sense. Um, and so I think initially that's why I went for that kind of approach. Um, and I think now as, I've, as I'm stepping further into entrepreneurship, um, you know, like we said, you know, for an entrepreneur, no two days are the same pretty much. Um, and so because I'm having, and, and again, I think this ties into something we talked about in the beginning about having transferable skills, right? Um, so because I'm having these situations every day, different things, different challenges, um, different situations occurring in my entrepreneurial life um, that's made me more adaptable, that's made me more willing to color outside the lines as it were Um, and I think that's also translated into not just my way of thinking but the way I'm consuming and the way I'm learning as well so I'm more prepared to kind of break out of the structured you know regimen and you know pick up a book that is addressing a situation that I, I need to resolve this week, not thinking, you know, maybe too too far ahead as to what I need to cover this quarter. If that makes sense. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Mm. Because I think about that a lot of like adding, trying to add structure to like to my day, to my weeks, my months. Mm. Um, but also to be able to just be free and to kind of, feel it out and, and really act based on intuition. And what I found is that, and I'd be interested to know if it's similar to you, uh, for you too, is that in some areas of my life, I have to have structure. I mean, I have to. Like, for example, with with my investments, I have to have a very yeah. structured system that I've taken the time to to build, to craft with a lot of care and intention and now I can just kind of work my machine and and just you know just maintain it, adjust as needed. But but I built the core vehicle, right? And it's structured, and I don't have to really think about it, um, you know, in like a, oh well, now I just you know got this dollar. Now where what am I going to do with that, right? It's like I've, I've already thought about that, you know. Yeah. Um, but then in other areas of my life, like for example, like reading, just to, you know, keep it congruent. Um, I kind of just operate on, on a whim of like, what do I want to learn about today? You know? And, um, but then, it, but then with something like exercise, for example, sometimes it is really structured and sometimes it's not like, for example, now that it's the summer, I love biking and I love swimming and I love walking and I just love being outside, right. And getting a lot yep. of sun. Um, and so it's like some mornings I wake up and then go for a bike ride and then immediately swim like today, you know? Other times I get up and walk the dog. But then at night, usually almost always before I go to sleep, I try to take a nice long walk, Mm. read a little bit more, relax, and get a little bit more exercise. And the pup loves it. The puppy just absolutely loves that. I bet he does, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) So it's like I I feel like in different areas it requires different amounts of structure. Have you kind of found that to be similar for you? Yeah, that, that, that's true, actually. I think um, maybe to put it in terms like, like a business context. So um, 
So I'm a massive advocate for systemizing things. Um, you know, I believe in automation, maybe because of my, you know, my background. Um, and I think, I guess, just to give you some specifics. Um, so, you know, my business is basically built around, you know, speaking on stage at various events, uh, whether corporately or, you know, personal development. Um, and for me, you know, the way where I found structure really helpful is to sort of, when, when it comes to automating and outsourcing those backend processes, so in terms of my marketing, in terms of social media to an extent, um, in terms of, you know, email campaigns, in terms of, you know, content creation and scheduling things ahead of time. You know, I found that really useful because it takes the weight off my mind thinking, you know, like you said, you know, here's a dollar, what am I going to do with it? Or, you know, in my case, that would be, oh gosh, I haven't created any YouTube videos for a long time. Um, what do I want to talk about today? And, you know, that's a really difficult place to start from um, <laughs> because then you're, you're really trying to create content under pressure, which isn't really how you want to be doing it. Um, and so for me, specific tools that have helped me is getting help. You know, <laughs> there there are things which are not really my forte. You know, I can use social media, but I wouldn't class myself as a social media manager. I think there's a difference. Um, you know, I wouldn't know about when I should be posting my content in order to reach the most people that I'm trying to reach, um, and none of those specifics. So I guess it's it's just being open to the idea of, you know, what is your zone of genius. Um, and then anything that's outside of that zone of genius, how can I either automate it, um, outsource it, or terminate it if it's not really adding value to me or to my business? Um, because, you know, there's, there's a stat, you know, that, you know, crazy high percentage number of businesses fail in the first couple of years. I think it's like 90% or something crazy. Um, but I believe it's not because that they're not talented entrepreneurs or ta talented business owners or that they have a bad idea or anything like that. I think most of it comes down to overall trying to do too much, you know, trying to be everything and, you know, be every single department of your own corp mini corporation because that's what you are. Um, so if you're able to just kind of filter out the noise and focus on that zone of genius, whether it's as a speaker, as a personal trainer, as a chef, whatever, yeah? Focus on that thing which comes inherently easily and naturally to you. And with the other stuff, the, the stuff that you need to automate and structure, then let that, you know, vehicle just run itself. Absolutely. And dude, I will say one of the vehicles like that, that makes my life so much easier, like some of that structure, it has to do with the podcast and, and, and the show. And there's like a very specific thing that happens after every single, well, bef starting before <laughs> until, until the interview is published. And luckily I am so grateful to have an amazing team that helps mm. me with this. Right. Um, and, and they have graciously uh, agreed to use the system that I've created. Right. So I literally sat down for hours and days, dude, this took me a long time to <laughs> sit down and write this stuff out. But I went like word by word documenting exactly what needed to go down from beginning to end of the whole process. And I wrote it down and I took screenshots and I was like, I, I tried to build it to where like, you know, my little eight-year-old cousin could could operate it. Right. And I mean, she's very intelligent. She's very smart, but maybe that's a bad example. Like anybody could do it regardless of, of who you are and regardless of, of, you know, what's going on. And that structure uh, internally has then allowed and empowered my team to be able to deal with the crazy chaotic randomness of the external world. And it is that has been such a huge like weight off of my shoulders because now I can focus on the fun stuff like what we're doing right now, 
getting to chat. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. And I, th- I think I can relate to that a lot, actually. Um, yeah, systems, guys. Just, you know, systemize as much as you can, especially of those things that are not really your forte. Um, and I think what I really liked about what you said was when when you talked about breaking it down step by step, which isn't a natural thing for every, everyone to do. Um, but I followed a similar process with my VAs. And, you know, I've got these well-documented standard operating procedures, which, again, they can be run by anybody. And I think the value you get there is, of course, is they're very painful to create <laughs> because you really have to look at your process. And, you know, f- you know, for me or for you running your own process, it's easy. You know, you could do it with your eyes closed. It, but it's when you have to break it down to a level where somebody else has to explain what it is that you do on a day-to-day basis, having never seen the stuff before. That's when you realize that actually there's a lot to it. Um, but that initial pain or that initial investment that you make pays for itself over such a long period because it's kind of like do it once and then you just hand it off. And after that, it's just automated, you know, either by someone else in your team or you know if if you have an automated system then that just kind of runs in the background so um so yeah definitely a big advocate for that you got my vote there absolutely and in what has actually been interesting um to observe having having done that and and um you know now using that sort of system uh there are three really interesting things one is that it forces you to document the very best course of action because you're not going to document something that's sh- that's shitty right like you're you want to be like the very top like you want to put write down and have done the most excellent thing that could be done for for any particular decision and in, in any particular process way so it brings out the best also it exposes the flaws in your thinking because when somebody else comes and they try to make it work Inherently, the first time, most likely, there are going to be problems. There are going to be like something you didn't include or something you didn't think about or something that maybe you just do it naturally that it didn't even occur to you that you need to write down. So it helps you. It, so it, it exposes the flaws. And because somebody's doing it over and over again, not only are they going to see some of the flaws that exist, but they will also be able to help you identify the opportunities for improvement. So it's actually a self-correcting system <laughs> that if yeah. you have and, and if you vet your teammates hard enough and you bring on a really good team, they can help you develop and fix that process over time to where it gets better and better and better and more efficient and more effective over time. It's really cool, actually. Yeah, yeah. And actually, one more that I would add to that list as well is – it's actually a cure for procrastination uh, because, and I'm thinking in the sense of, you know, as there'll be many people listening to this who are in business or content creators. And I think, you know, I'm, I'm thinking of, you know, way back when I started and I was trying to um, build my website, for example, you know, and I spent so much time building this thing and putting everything in position and making sure that it was perfect according to my standards. Um, but then I realized that this was going to take forever because I was never happy with it. Um, but all of a sudden, when you hand that thing off or you, you know, you, you create an SOP or process for somebody else to do it, it kind of breaks that emotional connection that we have with our own stuff because sometimes we get to, um, you know, it's our baby. It's, it's your business. It's your podcast. It's your speaking career, right? And so you get so attached to it to a point where it actually becomes hindrance um because now you're you're not really uh for example in your case creating you know tons and tons of podcasts because you're still obsessing about how you're going to create the first perfect podcast (laughs) right or for me i'm thinking oh gosh you know i'm i'm never gonna create a youtube video because i don't like any of the videos that i've shot so far Um, But when you put yourself under the pressure of, you know, today is my filming day, I have to shoot five videos and then I have to hand them off to somebody else to take care of the editing and I paid them already. So now there's no debate. I just have to give you five videos, whatever those look like. And, you know, they're going to do their thing and whatever goes out, goes out. So, you know, it it, kind of forces you to maybe make those steps um, a little bit quicker than perhaps you would like to if you had all the time in the world. 
Absolutely. Absolutely. I read somewhere, um, you know, kind of, kind of by the same vein, um, there was a study done on university students. And I think it was in something like ceramics or pottery, something cool like that. And the students had to build the ultimate um, creation, you know, the ultimate uh, piece. I don't, I don't know the right way to say it, but I think you get what I'm saying. And one group took the uh, strategy or, 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 you know, devoted their time to planning out the very best one. And they, they, you know, tinkered and they read and they studied and they did all these things, but they only created one uh, piece that was right before um, they had to present it, you know, to the class or wherever they're playing. Mm-hmm. The other team just got to work and just produced piece after piece after piece after piece every day they produce pieces so they had created hundreds of pieces at the end of the semester whatever the time period was and so what was interesting was the team that had taken all the time to craft the perfect one theirs was and not subjectively but objectively far inferior than the team who had just created and created and just kind of let it flow and let it happen because they had gone through the process so many times and they had developed their own style through creating that they theirs was just better it was was optimized yeah exactly exactly so i i think you know i think for creators which i would uh i would um boldly uh assume that we both are um you know just just kind of jumping into it Mm. is almost the best way to do it like dude the very first podcast on the show (laughs) like the guest was amazing (laughs) shout out to you jeremy you rock but my like execution of that was awful dude it was awful (laughs) i had a terrible microphone i didn't even do video it was audio it was scratchy, not well done at all. I didn't know what I was doing. <laughs> I didn't know what to ask. Like it was in, you know, in some ways, in a lot of ways, a total disaster, right? But each one you get a little bit better and you get a little bit better and a little bit better. And over time, you get to a point where you really start to feel good and you start yeah. to feel confident. You're like, damn this is really fun. And I feel like I'm really doing a significantly better job than I was before. And, and that progress, in my opinion, comes from that repetition, just going at it time and time again. Mm. Mm. And, and isn't it really rewarding as well when you compare, you know, that version of you, you know, episode one versus, you know, today's episode or a more recent episode and you can see, you know, that progression that, and, that you, you get a lot of fulfillment, I believe, from seeing your steps, um, even even when they're not perfect to begin with. And I think, you know, this also ties back to what we said about earlier, kind of going out and looking for those obstacles. Um, because the, the safe thing to do would be to kind of hide, you know, behind, you know, whatever, your bedroom or whatever, or practice in front of the mirror until you felt you were pitch perfect. But then what that would mean, you know, going back to your clay example, was that you'd only deliver one piece at the end of it as opposed to just kind of getting stuff out there, throwing throwing stuff against the wall and seeing what sticks and eventually you realize that you've actually created something that is super duper optimized. Yeah. And, and that's such a great point that like when you've created so many things, you never really know what's going to stick. I mean, you, you like I could say this. I have zero ability to predict what is going to be a hit and what is not going to be a hit. Like, I just don't know. And, and, and what's fascinating to me is that some of the things that you may not even think are all that, those could be the hardest hitting, um, the, the hardest hitting things you create. I'll give you an example. There was a time in college where I was really into sociology and I actually have it now on my calendar to go back and, and study 
the pieces of sociology that really interested me again. That's literally on my calendar uh, coming up soon. So I'm excited for that. But what I did was I started to read on it and I started to read up on it. And in my opinion, or for me, the best way that I learn is actually by teaching. Um, I actually think there's some psychology behind that that I don't yeah. know. and I, I really should research. But for whatever reason, I learn the best when I'm teaching. And so I did this video talking about like the basics of sociology. You know, just talking about like a, br- a very brief introduction talking about how it's, you know, it's a study of society, the study of groups of people and how different people interact. And it, it was like a seven or eight minute video, right? And I, I didn't think any uh, anything. I posted it on YouTube and I didn't think anything of it. Well, fast forward a couple of years, it had gotten tens of thousands of views, which is pretty sweet, right? And also Pearson, like the education company, mm-hmm. reached out to me and asked – if they could, they, if they could buy the rights to that video to okay. use their testing material, and I was like, "All right, yeah. let's talk. <laughs> I'm interested, dude." Something that took me eight minutes to sit down and create, like they paid me thousands of dollars to use that in their testing material. Wow! And wow. and I didn't, I couldn't have predicted that. There's no way. I could have, there's no way I could have sat down and said, I'm going to create this video on sociology with the intent of Pearson picking (laughs) it up (laughs) and using it. No chance, no chance. Yeah. No way, yeah. And and I think that also links as well to the the social media stuff, right? Um, Because, you know, like, like how we said, nowadays many people are living for the engagement, for the comments, for the likes. And what you start to notice, or at least I have, maybe I'm looking at the wrong profiles, but a, a lot of profiles seems to have a, a very generic set of content. Um, and I guess for me, it, it feels like, I could be wrong, but it feels like people are playing safe. So they know the things that work. They know the things, the type of images, the type of videos that get them those high engagement numbers. Um and so they just keep posting that stuff over and over and over, right? Um, and then you get to a place, I'd imagine, where, you know, you are getting, you know, the engagement, but you're not really, you're not really innovating um, as a performer, entrepreneur, whatever it is. Um, and I've also tried to be really self-conscious about that because I also know the kind of things that I post and I get super engagement and other things less so. Um, but like you said, you, you know, by mixing it up, you know, throwing the stuff against the wall, that's when you discover, A, the hidden gems, um, and B, again, it also links back to the authenticity because, you know, we all have unique traits, unique personalities, unique things to offer. So if you keep offering the same dish over and over again, you're only showing one side of who you are, right? So if people are really going to get to know you, people are really going to understand your full value, then, you know, be prepared to open the whole the whole fridge door for them um, and let them, you know, ha- have a look at what else you have inside. And it may not appeal to everybody. Um, there might be people might have their favorites, but I think it's important to keep, um, to keep extending yourself because well, why lock yourself to you know, one or two ideas, one or two offers, one or two products when there might be five or 10 inside of you. I love that. I love that because in, in for two reasons, I think one is the more that you show and that you give and, and the more you open up and let people in to see the more chances they have to really fall in love with what you're doing and to really benefit from the work that you create. So I think just from a, like a, an ROI perspective, it's just better business to do it that way. But, yeah. but, but also from like a, you know, like a philosophical perspective of, you know, being a creator and putting things out there in the world that are, or at least that have the potential to profoundly impact the way humanity operates. The, the people who do that, they're contributing original thought or an yeah. original take on existing thought. 
right? I mean, think of somebody like, and and we've talked it, we've talked about him before, um, but think of somebody like Socrates or Confucius or Lao Tzu, and th- those two are particularly prevalent in my mind because I, I just finished reading the Analects and uh, and the Tao Te Ching, but those are profound pieces of content. Hmm. They weren't copied from anybody else that I'm aware of. They like they were they were that's that was original thought or something very close to original thought or at least presented in a way yeah. that profoundly impacted a lot of people. And if you want to stand out and you want to make a splash and you want to impact a billion people if you know like in my opinion it would seem like you would have to put something fresh something new something original something mm. unique to only you into the world and and put yeah. it out there yeah yeah it, it's it's how you repackage it it's how you put your original spin on it um because like you said a lot of the knowledge that we have is you know it's it's not unique but it's how you put your own stamp on it so that it's it's winston's version of resilience you know it's it's your version of a podcast um and i think only when you do that do that do people then see oh okay this dude's got he's got a lot more in his locker than what we've seen already um and and that, yeah like you said i think that's the direction we should all be heading as creators for sure definitely so that kind of that kind of leads me to a to a, a curious spot of do you think that there is any more original thought to be created Ooh. or do you think all of it's already been put out there and we're just remixing it uh, i don't think um that's a good question actually i think a lot of the fundamental ideas that we, you know, the principles that we all understand, you know, right and wrong, you know, personal development, um, business, fundamentals. I think all of those things are pretty much, you know, there'll, there'll be different presenters, coaches, and speakers who put their own spin on those topics. But I think the fundamentals stay the same. Um, so I guess the short answer would be to say that, you know, fundamentally, I think everything is already here. It's just how we repackage it and how we present it. But I'm never going to say never in terms of, you know, there might be some, you know, important things that we haven't witnessed happen yet. I think that's that's sort of my initial view on it. Um, and And sometimes you can put your own spin on something in such a way that, it almost feels like a completely new idea. Um, and I think it, it's also a matter of, um, in my view, perspective. Um, because I think about all the other, because this is my field, um, I think about all the other motivational speakers, all the other inspirational speakers. Um, and I think that, you know, why uh, why should why, why should there be that many motivational speakers? Because fundamentally, kind of saying the same thing um, but I think where perspective comes into it is sometimes you just need to hear that same message that you've heard all along from your parents from your teachers you know from your colleagues and then all of a sudden you hear it from Winston and it just clicks but why did that happen it's just perspective it's just you know you've heard it from here 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 but you needed to hear it from there and, and that's all it is. And for me, that's almost equal to bringing in, you know, a completely new idea to the table and completely new thought, because that perspective is what makes it, um, is what makes it different, makes it different. It could be the same information, but the perspective gives it that unique point of view that it might as well be something that you've never heard before. I love if that. that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, that's really cool. And And I also think, <laughs> There's even another facet or another layer to this that I I believe that all the information is it already exists. Like all information is there. It is just inherently there. And we as people, as humanity, we are increasing our levels of awareness to where we kind of 
not kind of, but we discover new information. Mm-hmm. You know, like when we discover a new species of animal, that that species was was there before yeah, so we discovered it. it. We didn't right. create it because we found out about it. We just discovered it because we increased our level of awareness and, and our level of consciousness. What are your thoughts on 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 that? Mm, yeah, that no, that is that is a very good angle actually because it's it's the awareness, and I think again, I think we're really fortunate to live in this age that we live in. It's the information age, right? Um, we talk about social media. We talk about the good and the bad side of social media. Uh, talked about the internet, the digital world that we live in. Um, I think one of the really good points is you know, how it helps us be connected to each other. You know, you and I are on different sides of the globe, I believe. Um, But yeah, we're able to have a conversation, you know, like we're just sitting across each other from a a coffee table. Um, And I think that ability has opened up avenues of us building self-awareness in different areas of knowledge. in perhaps maybe our previous generations, our ancestors didn't have because they lived such siloed, such closed off lives because what tended to happen was you just know what was happening in your community and that's it, you know? Um, And so I think this is where we can leverage the tech um, and leverage these platforms, you know, that 80% creation mode to allow other people to learn about us and for us to be able to share those unique things which perhaps other people hadn't been exposed to to that point isn't it fascinating to think about that like like somebody 4000 years ago could have been the smartest gal or guy <laughs> ever yeah but but we have access to so much more information like we have unprecedented Acts like so much more access than any of our ancestors ever. Like, what 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 could Ben Franklin have done with <laughs> with Google? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> could have been amazing. <laughs> and I'm just gonna give you a heads up, Ben, because I'm I'm on a cell phone here, and it's just gonna die out in the next few minutes. But I'm just gonna give you a heads up in case I do cut off suddenly. Okay. Well. Then, then maybe on that note, we uh, we we can we can start to wrap up. Um, man, it, it has been such an honor to, uh, to share. We need to do this again. Here. We need to do a part two. I think. Yeah, definitely, <laughs> definitely. I would, uh, I would, I would really love that, man. Um, so, you know, I want to thank you very much for uh, for coming on the show, um, and and uh, sharing everything that you have, and being willing to share some of your time with me. So, thank you. No, dude, I appreciate it. And, you know, I learned so much from our conversation. So, yeah, the feeling is mutual. Well, I just have one more question for you. Then uh, then we'll wrap it on up. Um, oh, how old are you, by the way? I'm 33. Okay, so I'm 24. And, and I, I wanted to ask that because, you know, I want to ask from specifically my perspective. And, <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, I want to ask specifically of your perspective. But what question should I be asking you mm. that I just wouldn't think to ask? <laughs> Ooh, okay. So I need to go back into a 24-year-old mode, do I? <laughs> um, I think when, yeah, because 24 is nearly 10 years ago for me now. Um, and at that stage, I was fairly new in corporate um, and I was sort of finding my feet I think I would say that I I had a good self-awareness, but I think what I'd have liked to know from someone 10 years older is, you know, how do you move from a place where, because I think, and I think maybe you're a little bit different, you know, the average 24-year-old, you're pretty self-aware. But I think for me, what I would have wanted to know of myself is, you know, is there is there more to life than, you know, just having fun, having that job, having those materialistic things? Well, ladies and gentlemen, I think we uh, I think we may have actually gotten disconnected from Winston. Um, that's, a, that's a sneaking suspicion. 
So, you know, I want to say thank y'all very, very much for being part of the show, for uh, for sticking with us um, this whole time. Um, I feel very, very lucky to have been able to uh, get to chat with with Winston today. So um, shout out to you, Winston. You rock, man. Thank you so much. And um, to everybody who's watching and listening, I want to thank y'all very, very much. And I will see y'all on the next episode. Take care.